Well, good morning. It is a joy to see you as we gather for worship on this day on the Trinity campus. Would you please hear God's word? Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember wonders he has done, his miracles and his judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Israel, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. Join me, please, as we pray together. Oh God, we bow before you this morning as the great creator God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We praise you and honor you. We thank you for the privilege we have together today on this campus to hear your word proclaimed, uh, to be encouraged by your spirit. And we pray that your blessing and anointing might rest upon our preacher this day Sandy Wilson. Thank you for bringing him here to be with us. We pray that you would use his time on the Trinity campus this week for our good. We thank you, O oh God, for opportunities of service that extend beyond this chapel, beyond the classroom, across this region and around the world. And we pray today your blessings upon Trinity grads who are serving in so many and various places. We trust you today, O oh God, for those in our community who uh, need your help, uh, who need your comfort and strength and healing, and uh, we ask for your presence with them. And now we ask for your presence with us. Um, bless this hour, we pray, in a way that would strengthen us to follow you more faithfully, bring glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. It is indeed a joy to see you. We are glad that, to have many who are here as a part of the Timothy series. A three, over the next three days, today, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, we'll be blessed to hear from our preacher uh, this week, uh, the Reverend Sandy Wilson. Uh, Sandy Wilson has served as pastor of the Second Presbyterian Church in Memphis, Tennessee, for the past 21 years. Uh, he has uh, experience uh, beyond uh, that in prior service, and his work in Memphis has been an amazing thing to behold. Uh, he has influenced that uh, great city with his leadership, with the gospel, uh, by being involved in the urban community, by helping prepare a new generation of leaders, uh, by helping people think strategically about ways to connect the gospel with the marketplace in that area. I had the privilege to watch almost looking down the street uh, for 18 and a half years and seeing his amazing work, uh, hearing him proclaim uh, the good news of the gospel on a weekly basis. And it's a joy to have him here with us. He's a graduate of University of Virginia, Gordon-Conwell Seminary, uh, we are so pleased to have Allison here, his wife, and many of you probably know his daughter Mary is one of our finest PhD students in the Old Testament area, and uh, it's a delight to have them here together uh, today. They have uh, four other children, ten grandchildren, and uh, just an amazing family. We thank God uh, for them. Uh, his services at Second Presbyterian used to be broadcast or they still are, CBS affiliate that's all over the Mid-South uh, region, every Sunday morning. If I was not speaking somewhere, I can assure you that I was at the 8 o'clock service at my home church so I could be home by 10 o'clock to hear Sandy Wilson preach. Uh, he is one of the finest preachers in the United States today. We are honored uh, to have him in the Trinity pulpit. Would you join me, please, in welcoming Sandy Wilson to Trinity Chapel. The scripture reading for today is from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Please turn with me in your Bibles. If you'd like to follow along, I will be reading from the New International Version. 2 Timothy, 
chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. It is a pleasure to be here at TED's. And Dr. Dockery, thank you for that very kind introduction. And you know, uh, you folks here in the Chicago area owe us a big one in the Mid-South when you took David and Lanise from us. Uh, they did such a marvelous job at Union University. As soon as he was announced as the next president here, I called my daughter, Mary, who's a student here, as David mentioned. And I said to her, I don't know if you'll be there long enough to see all the fireworks, but Trinity University is going to be a different place uh, because David is such a marvelous leader. Those of you who work closely with him know that that's true, and David is just always an honor and privilege to be with you and others that I, I know well, but most of you I don't. But I do know that you're in graduate school, and I used to be there myself. And I just want to encourage you. Sometimes you know with all the papers and the exams and the books you're to read, and you're reading them so fast, you feel like you can hardly retain the content of them. I just want to tell you that I still appreciate greatly the three years that were set aside for me to do a Master's of Divinity. It's a very, very important degree. It's a very important time in your life. I know you're not all Master's students, but particularly that degree. For those of you who are doing your Master's work, it's foundational for all of your ministry. Of course, you'll be reading and studying and learning all your life, uh, but those three years are absolutely foundational, and that's the reason that when our own uh, young adults talk to me about going to seminary, I first of all always suggest they have some uh, experience after college before they go to seminary, especially the men, if you don't mind my saying so, um, because they're less mature ladies. We know this, don't we? Um, but uh, I always say to them, you need to go to a place that's really theologically sound. And Trinity is one of those I always mention. As a matter of fact, we have two pastors in our church who are graduates from Trinity, and you'd be glad to know that they're doing a wonderful job in their church. So Trinity has a great reputation where, where we are. Well, we've been assigned a topic this year, haven't we? The sting of death. And it's a very, very important topic. Uh, it's one that I rejoice to speak about briefly today and then on Thursday because uh, we're the ones who have an answer for it. Uh, the old uh, British playwright Somerset Maugham said, death is dull and a dreary affair. My advice to you is to avoid it whatever the cost. <laughs> and I was speaking with Dr. Worley just a few moments ago about how the younger secular generation speaks of death and how they deal with it. And his comment was, they would prefer not. Uh, <laughs> they, they try to avoid it. And that's exactly what Maugham was saying. Uh, just, let's just avoid it at all costs. You know, like Woody Allen said, I, I'm not afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Um, and, and that's generally the way that the, the culture is dealing with it, through humor and arm's length and not dealing with it at all. Uh, for those of us who, who know the Lord, uh, we, we come to our faith in Christ and we enjoy so many benefits. I, I recall having been converted at age 25, it's very clear to me the change in my own life. And the benefits, I recall, that I began to enjoy in those first weeks of my conversion were just phenomenal. But one of them that was very clear to me, it's not so much that God has a plan for me in this life. The, the joy is he's got a plan for me in the next life. And uh, I realized very early on that the greatest benefit of all is that God has solved for us this human tragedy of death and has turned it into something absolutely glorious. So today... Uh, what I thought we'd do is look at this text that Daniel read and examine these three verses for a few moments. Because if we're seeking to help other people with the issue of death, which of course is what we're all here to do is to help other people. Uh, if we're seeking to help other people dealing with their own death, the first thing we must do is to deal with our own death. I found this to be a general principle that uh, all my ministry in seeking to help other people comes largely from our own experience. It comes from the Bible, 
but through my own experience. For example, if someone says, how do you avoid the temptation to pornography? Then I just simply say, here's what I do. If someone says, how do you deal with a, a spat you have with your spouse? Here's what I do. If someone says, how much do you give financially? Here's what I do and why I do it this way. So I find in pastoral counsel, it's just inevitable that when you're seeking to help other people, you enter into their situation, you're trying to help them deal with what they're dealing with, and you just enter it and you're beginning to think, how would I deal with this were I in those shoes? And that inevitably leads back to what do I do in the shoes I am wearing? So when we're dealing with the issue of death, we first need to deal with our own death. It's interesting that we're in the Timothy series, and of course it's appropriate that we look at one of Paul's epistles to Timothy, who was his protege, as you know. This appears to be Paul's last letter. He knows that his death is imminent. But the point of the letter, as you know, is not so much for Paul to describe what he thinks about death, but to charge his protege with taking the baton forward, holding on to the gospel and being faithful to it. Timothy, of course, was a timid man. Paul, by nature, seemed to be uh, a, a bolder person by personality. And of course, Paul, I'm sure, had things to be concerned about as he handed on the baton. But in the midst of it, he describes his situation to Timothy in this text. And in it, he reveals for us, under the stress of facing imminent death, his own view about his own death. And he's seeking to convey to Timothy that same perspective and I would say it's, it really is quite impossible to deal with a gospel ministry, whether it's in the academy or in the church or wherever you're going to be. It's quite impossible to, to communicate a gospel ministry unless you've applied the gospel to your life, and especially in this area of death. So let's dig in and take a look at it. Paul, I think, gives us three nice concepts in these three verses. In verse 6, it seems to me that he shows us, when he thinks about his own death, that he's ready to die. It's very obvious. He's ready to die, and there's a reason for it. And so I want to say to you, if you want to, if you want to minister life to people who are dying, you need to be ready to die. In verse 7, I think he shows us another key of facing our own death, and that is to live a life right now upon which you can look later on as you approach your own death and look upon it with satisfaction. Paul's able to look upon his life with satisfaction. That's a preparation for death. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And then in verse 8, clearly, in order for us to face our own death, we must be the people who anticipate the future as a glory for his people, for all of us. So there's a sense of anticipation and hope that rises up within us, and especially as we face our death. Now, these elements, it seems to me, are constituent elements of a gospel minister. A man or a woman who's going to minister to somebody else in the midst of their own fear of death. So let's, let's look at this first concept then in verse 6. And that is that if we are to face our own death in a healthy way, we must be ready to die. Paul says, my own life is being poured out as a drink offering. Now, there are reasons for that analogy. Uh, certainly, you look in the Old Testament, you know what a drink offering is. It's the, the wine that's poured upon the, the bullock or the, the ram as the main offering. But then the drink offering is offered as a sacrifice of thanksgiving or maybe a special vow that's made. It's something that's added to the main sacrifice. And Paul is using the analogy, it seems, because he's quite aware. Of course, he, he's not dying to atone for our sins. Jesus is doing that. He's making the big offering and sacrifice. But Paul has been pouring out his life and even now is pouring it out as a thank out offering on the offering of Jesus. And isn't that exactly what we are all doing? We share in his afflictions. It's an amazing thing that we share in his nature. We, we're about his ministry. We pour our little wine offering on top of the, the big offering that the Lord Jesus makes. But also because obviously the Apostle Paul, being a Roman citizen, is not going to be crucified like either Jesus or Peter, but he knows he's probably to be beheaded. And of course the blood and all, everything that occurs with that, he's saying that my whole life is being poured out as I face my execution. But then he calls it a departure, you notice in verse 6. So his life is a drink offering. That's the nature of his whole life. It's a sacrifice. But, but then it leads to this beautiful departure 
And the word, as some of you would know, is a word that's often used for a ship that's uh, loosening its moorings and heading out to sea. So Paul is going on a journey. So he sees death, not as the end of the road, but as the gateway to the rest of his journey. It's a delightful verse in giving us an idea of why Paul is ready to face death. And so we must be able to do the same. Allison and I, and Allison is, is here, of course, and our, uh, one of our sons, uh, Ben, uh, was a Marine officer, and he served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he was the last one of our children to profess his faith publicly. And he was getting up in his 20s, and it was making his parents spend more time on their knees and, and uh, wringing their hands and worrying, I'm sure, which we're not supposed to do, but I'm sure we did, over his spiritual condition. But, you know, when his profession of faith came, it was his first time on the battlefield. And he had a Christian rearing, of course, and he had a general uh, framework of the scriptures, and he knew that he was not ready for battle because he was not ready to die. And with all the tears and the sadness that goes with sending a child to the battlefield, I, I realized that in God's economy, he, he had my son there to face the fact that he needed to be ready to die. And we got this lovely letter that still brings tears to our eyes from our son as he describes how he says, Mom and Dad, I want you to know I've fully given my life to Jesus Christ and I'm ready now to engage the, the duties that are before me. Just pray that I'll be faithful. And we couldn't, of course, get through the letter uh, at one time. It took several sittings because we were sobbing. But here's a man who knew he had to be able to die. And you know, it seems to me that those engaged in the Christian ministry, we have to be ready to die happily. The fact of the matter is, I'm sure Dr. Dockery would say this in his years of Christian leadership, that uh, never has, that I know of, has his neck been threatened, but it feels like it. And there are decisions that one must make in leadership that feel like you could get killed. You could get killed in your career, you could get killed in your social life, you could get killed in your emotions, you could get killed in relationships. It feels like a death, and I've been there on a number of occasions. And I don't know how we can make the decisions that we need to make as people being trained for Christian ministry and leadership if we're not ready to die. So in order for us to enter the life and the death of God's saints, we have to be the ones who have become ready to die. Secondly, notice in verse 7, we not only must be ready to die in order to help others with their death, but we must live lives upon which we can look with great satisfaction whenever the time comes. Now, some scholars have questioned Paul's propriety in boasting about his fight, his race, his maintenance of the faith. But Paul is really not boasting about what he's done. If he did, this verse would be a lot longer, in my opinion. Uh, the Apostle Paul has got to be the greatest Christian who ever lived. If Paul were enumerating his accomplishments, can you imagine, uh, even with Christian humility, you'd have to say, you know, I started off 25 years ago and no one except Barnabas thought that I should even evangelize the Gentiles. Most of the church was opposed to the ministry that God had put upon my heart. I went out and struck out on my own with Barnabas and later with Silas and others. There were virtually no churches. I mean, we know the Roman church existed, maybe, maybe a few others, but virtually no churches in Asia Minor, no churches in Southern Europe. And 25 years later, Paul is sitting here ready to be executed, and he could look back over Asia Minor and Southern Europe and say that every major city has a church in it. And he's discipled leaders all over the Mediterranean world. And he has stood down kings and magistrates and scholars and priests. This man has boldly moved the kingdom of God forward. I mean, there's no one like him in the 2,000 years since Christ ascended. So if a man were to boast, I think he would probably do better than this. 
But notice what Paul says about himself positively. He doesn't list his accomplishments. He just simply says, I endured and I was faithful to the end. That's what was important to him. That's what brought satisfaction to him. Now look at the first phrase. He said, I fought the good fight, the noble fight. You know, we can all pick fights. Preachers pick, pick fights all the time, and sometimes the wrong ones. Paul says, I picked the right one, and I fought it. And he calls it a fight or a, an agony, you know, to, to the, the Greek word agonizo, agony or struggle. He says, I struggled the good struggle. I fought the good fight. And of course, that's what the Christian faith is. And if you live it, it is a fight. And we don't just have spiritual warfare when we have a prayer meeting and walk around a few blocks of the city. Spiritual warfare is 24-7. It's all the time. That's what Paul means in Ephesians 6. It's 24-7. It's every day of the year. It is a fight to the end. And Paul says, I fought it. I engaged it. And I want to say to you that the best preparation for death is to get into the right fight and fight it till the very end until you don't have breath left. Fight it. Stay on target. Live the mission out. We were singing just a moment that uh, all I have is Christ. And I thought, Wilson, you are the biggest phony. Look at all that stuff you've got. Christ is not all you've got. I've got a household of belongings. I've got children and grandchildren. I've got friends. I've got a bank account. I can retire here in a few years maybe. I've got all kinds of things. But I really don't have them, do I? It's coming to an end at death. All I have is Christ. Let's live that way now. That's what Paul is saying. I fought the fight. Secondly, he says, I ran the race. I got on the right track. I figured out what the race was, and it's a marathon. And I ran it. He stayed in the race. Paul says, you remember to the Ephesian elders that I consider my life worth nothing to me. If I can just finish the race, complete the task that he has given to me of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That's your preparation for death. And then you look back and you say, you know, I committed a lot of sins. I'm completely dependent upon Christ for my forgiveness, but, but I ran the right race. Stay in it. And then Paul says, I kept the faith. And here, of course, you could argue whether it's subjective or objective. Is he talking about his, his trust in the Lord or is he talking about the doctrines of the gospel? And probably it's both. But the emphasis in 2 Timothy seems to be to Timothy to hold on to the truths of the gospel, to guard the deposit of the gospel. So it's likely Paul is emphasizing that maybe more than the other. And I have to say in, in my 35 years of pastoral ministry that I know there's nothing new under the sun, but it's amazing what keeps coming up. You know, when I was in seminary, we were just kind of finishing the battle for the Bible. You know, and the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy had come out and we kind of definitively settled it among evangelicals. And now who would have imagined that 35 years later, we would be coming out and say, not that the Bible is irrelevant or that the Bible is not true, but that the Bible is immoral. Who would have thought that we would defend the morality of Christ and the apostles and the Bible itself? So it's the same heresy, but it's spiraling downward. And so you'll find that, that all the old heresies, they come back in new clothing. They're the same old thing, but they, if a community is not revived or a nation is not revived, it comes back in a more virile form. And the training that you get, uh, formal training now and the training for the rest of your life, prepares you to address these things. And it will be a fight. And sometimes it will surprise you that the fight comes from within. You have to fight sometimes with fellow pastors or elders in churches, fighting for the faith, not fighting them to destroy them, but fighting to help them. And this is important for us to deal with death. You, you can see it now. Why does the, the younger, secular generation not want to talk about death? They have nothing to say about it. They've sacrificed all of the beautiful truths of the gospel. We must fight to preserve it and fight to communicate it. We must keep it. That takes hard work. I encourage you to continue to devote yourselves to the truths of the gospel so that at the end of the day, you can say, I fought the good fight. I ran the race. I kept the faith. I kept it. 
I didn't squander it. I didn't accommodate. How, why do people accommodate the culture? They do not want to be persecuted. They want to be cool and sophisticated. You find this throughout the ages. We accommodate what's around us to lower the temperature and make life easier for us. And so you must engage the fight. I remember seeing an article in First Things some years ago by Stanley Hourhouse, and the title of the, argue, of, the, of the article was Preaching as Though We Had Enemies. And Hourhouse's point was that there's a lot of preaching that one says, well, so what? What, what are you saying? What, where's the enemy? And we, we preach as though we're not even engaged in a fight. You know, I don't really want to know what you're thinking right now, and I don't want to know what my congregation thinks when I preach because it would scare the bejabbers out of me. But what I do know is I'm in a fight with you right now. The world, the flesh, and the devil seeking to distract you or to lure you in some other direction or to think that what I'm saying is narrow-minded. All kinds of things. We're fighting all the time. So we will have to devote ourselves to this kind of warfare in order to come to the end of the day and look back and say, I fought the good fight. I ran the race. I kept the faith. But now thirdly, notice in verse 8, the Apostle Paul shows us how we face our own death. First of all, by being ready to die. Pouring out our lives as drink offerings, looking forward to the departure and by living lives upon which we can look with satisfaction at the end of our days. But thirdly, we face our own death only if we can anticipate with joy the glory that is coming. The Apostle Paul makes no bones about it here. He's very clear about the glory that awaits him and all of us. He says in verse 8 that, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Of course, scholars will debate about what this righteousness is. Is he talking about the crown of justification? Because the word righteousness, justification, of course, being the same word. Is he just talking about being justified? Is he talking about a new condition of being practically righteous? Is he talking about a whole environment of righteousness that's being bestowed upon us? And I would say, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> it's a crown of righteousness in all of its respects. No uh, Presbyterian sermon should go without a quote from Calvin. Here's what Calvin says about it. <laughs> Calvin says, Justification by free grace, which is bestowed on us through faith, is not at variance with the rewarding of works. But on the contrary, those two statements perfectly agree that a man is justified freely through the grace of Christ, and yet that God will render to him the reward of works. For as soon as God has received us into favor, he likewise accepts our works, so as even to deign to give them a reward, though it is not due to them. I remember uh, years ago when my now 6'5 son, who's a, a head basketball coach in a college, was about that high <laughs> when he was about four years old. I was out on a cold autumn day raking the last leaves in the yard. And I usually rake later than anybody else in the neighborhood to their chagrin. But nonetheless, I was out there raking and I had about five piles. That's how many leaves I had. About five piles in the front yard. And here comes David. His mama had gotten a snowsuit on him, so he was kind of walking like a mummy. And he had his hat on and his gloves. It was a cold uh, fall, autumn day. And he had a rake, you know, and the, the handle of the rake went way over his head. And he came out, Daddy, can I help? So I said, sure, David, we'd be, be glad to have you help rake the leaves. So go, go right ahead, just rake any leaves you want to. So he proceeds to spread about three of my piles all over the yard. I mean, talk about negative work. That's what David had done. So in about... Seven or eight minutes after he had quickly destroyed three of my nice piles, his nose is running and his nose is red, his cheeks are red, and he comes over and he says, Daddy, I'm cold. And I said, well, Dave, just go right on in. You know, Mom will fix you some hot chocolate and take all that garb off and you'll, you can relax. Just go right on in. I was saying, please, go right on in. You can just go right on in and Mom will take care of you. So he kind of waddles to the front Steps, and then he turns around and he comes to me and he sticks out his hand and said, 
could I have a quarter? <laughs> and you know, like any good father, I said, a quarter for what? Rake, spread my leaves everywhere? You give me a quarter. No, I didn't say that. Here's what I did. I gave him 50 cents. Now, why did I do that? Was it because he earned it? <laughs> because of the intrinsic merit of his works? <laughs> no, au contraire, hop along. He owed me. And so here's why I gave him more than he even anticipated or asked for. Because he's my son. And he wanted to work with his daddy. He wanted to be about his father's business. It's just that simple. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I are going to do a lot of leaf scattering over the next years, as long as we live. And I, I, I realize that even when I'm at my best, I'm probably just scattering leaves. And then I get to, to heaven. And I say, what's that reward? I mean, a, a spanking I could understand. You know, let's just go ahead and get it over with. Just have a big spanking for all the leaf scattering I did for 35 years of pastoral ministry. And no, here comes the Lord himself personally. That's what Paul says. He will crown me personally. And I think, really? <laughs> Why? Because you're my brother. And you're about my father's business. And he loves that. So brothers and sisters, don't be discouraged about your foibles and failures, even your whoppers. When you turn to Jesus Christ, he forgives them. And not only that, as Calvin quite rightly said, he deigns, he condescends to reward you for things that are not only worthless, they're less than worthless. He condescends to reward you for things that you and I would call good works out of our immature understanding because you're his. You can rest in that. And Paul says, you know, some of you might think, Timothy, you might think that, of course, he's going to reward me. I'm, I'm the apostle. I got this thing started. But notice in verse 8, Paul says, not only for me, but for everyone who's longed for his appearing. Do you long for his appearing? Are your eyes fixed at the right hand of God where Jesus Christ is ruling? Are you waiting for him, anticipating him, expecting him? Do you realize that you, really, all you have is Jesus Christ and all that he has for you is beyond your wildest dreams? Samuel Rutherford, the great Puritan, said that this is what a godly person is. A person who has his or her feet firmly planted on the ground with their hands on the plow and their heads in the heavenlies. Now this is how we die. This is how we deal with our impending death. It is not only with endurance. It's not only with patience. It is with glorious expectation. And therefore then, when we deal with the people around us who are struggling deeply with death, everywhere, every Sunday in my church, every Sunday, without exception, we're praying for a grieving family. I counted up the other day over my 21 years, 750 funerals. I've buried a church. And I look at the names and tears come to my eyes. I miss these people desperately. And oh, how much their families must miss them. If I have no answer for that, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have a gospel. I don't have good news. But I have good news. <laughs> I have good news and so do you. And it begins with my enjoying the good news and sharing how I deal with my death with those who are struggling with their death. On Thursday, I want to share with you some practical experiences about dealing with folks who are in the throes of death or the throes of their loved ones facing death. But it all comes out of our faith in Jesus Christ. Get yourself rooted today. Whatever you're doing, at least this is what my, my Marine officer's son, Ben, says. He says, Dad, what we did as Marines in Iraq and Afghanistan is not going to last. And of course, that was a prophecy. You can see it didn't last. 
And he said, whatever we do and whatever price we pay, he said, it's nothing compared to what the Christian missionaries are doing there. And I say to you that if he knew he had to be prepared to die to do his work, do you not know you need to be prepared to die? Is there any reason why you'd need to stay here? Is there any business undone? Get it done. So that now you can live your life as a drink offering being poured out for him with anticipation of nothing less than the crown of righteousness placed upon your head by no one less than Jesus Christ, the Lord of righteousness. Let us pray. Father, we thank you with all of our hearts that after we had sinned and broken your law and come under the judgment of death, you graciously gave us a promise that you would send us one who would crush the head of our enemy, who would save us and rescue us from death itself. And so you have done through the sacrifice of his body and blood. We would enter into that sacrifice and offer ourselves as living sacrifices even today that we may minister this good news to those in the worst circumstances in the world. And we're so thankful that thousands upon thousands are coming to believe in you every day of the year. And we pray even today you will win a mighty triumph over death itself through sinners who turn to you and trust you for everlasting life. May we trust you. And may our lives reflect it in every aspect of our lives. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me take a moment just to remind you that as is our custom, immediately following chapel, the Henry Center has provided lunch for us so that we might have a question and answer session with our chapel speaker. So you're all warmly welcome for that lunch in Hinkson Hall immediately following the service. Let me also remind you that this evening at 7 o'clock in Concert 141, the bioethics colloquium continues. There'll be a slide on the screen immediately following our service with the details. Now let me ask you to stand with me, if you are able, and receive now the benediction. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may you always trust the one who calls you and who has faithfully accomplished your redemption. Amen. You may go in peace.